popped up for some reason. The yeah, ice didn't know I was taping and taping. Uh, and so we do see an expectation that people are going to follow through on their commitment. So that's just a recap of what we looked at last week. Now, moving forward to this week, how many of you um, love the PT test? Love the PT test. Love the PT test. Was that a sarcastic yes? That was a very sarcastic yes. I appreciate that sarcastic yes. Um, have you, some of you, and maybe you've been guilty of this before, known those people who really, they only did preparation for the PT test maybe two weeks to a month before their PT test. You, you've seen those, right? At, at, at my last base, we had a very large guard and reserve uh, presence. And, and uh, a lot of times what a lot of the guards, guardsmen and reservists would do would be they would, they would spend their entire annual tour getting ready for their PT test. And then at the end of their annual tour, their plan would be to take the PT test. Now in talking to many of them, uh, many of them, they hadn't done anything physically since their last PT test. And uh, the phenomenon is a lot of them found themselves injured. A lot of them uh, from suddenly going from nothing to something. And, and a lot of them found that they didn't do so well. Uh, but studies show, and if you don't agree with this, I'll have Bill Goins talk with you a little bit about this. Come on, husband. Uh, studies show that the best strategy for planning uh, for your PT test is regular workout routine and a regular diet. Just making fitness a, a lifestyle choice. That's what's going to do best. And, 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 and I know that for me, as one entering my mid-40s, I find it becomes even more important uh, that, I, that I prepare to eat well, that I prepare to work out well, that I do this all the time. A uh, regular pattern of fitness is the same way. In the same way, uh, one thing we're going to see tonight, spiritually, it goes the same way. And when it comes to evangelism, the scriptures tell us that we need to always be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have. And uh, it says that in 1 Peter 3.15. And so uh, the reality is we should always be ready. And, and what a lot of people fail to understand is you can't get ready when the moment comes. And, and, and Anybody who's ever done evangelism knows sometimes those opportunities to share the love of Christ just happen. And they happen in places you never uh, knew they would happen. And they happen in a, can't ch in a chance occurrence. Again, God's got it rigged. There are no chance occurrences. Uh, but they happen uh, when you did not prepare for them to happen. And so the reality is you've got to be ready. Uh, I often think, and, and I don't want to advocate for this. I know the Army does it. They, they'll do no-notice PT tests on their people. I'm glad we don't do that as an Air Force. The AFI says you can, though. They're, they're, the AFI says you can. I don't know anybody who does, but uh, you, they can do that. And I guess we should take that to heart and always be ready. But the same thing, spiritually, we need to find a way to always be ready. Now, in considering evangelism and the gospel, uh, before we take a look at some spiritual disciplines, uh, a concept I'd like to present to you is the, is the reality of evangelism as an innovation, as, as something that is innovative in our lives. Now, now, what is an innovation? An innovation is the act or process of introducing new ideas, devices, or methods. That's what uh, Merriam-Webster calls it. A lot of times when we think of new innovations, we think of new things, right? But the reality is an innovation can be something that is just new to you as well. Uh, Dr. Everett Rogers, he is, a, he, a, he is a sociologist, was a sociologist, he's very old now. Uh, he uh, developed a theory called the diffusion of innovation theory. Uh, it's also known as the social diffusion theory. Anybody been through Green Dot here, by the way? If you've been through Green Dot, that's the new program that Sapper is taking on. If you've been through Green Thought, it's dripping in social diffusion theory. Well, anyway, anyway, the social diffusion theory uh, is essentially a theory on why it is that some people adopt new innovations and other people don't. And, 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 and in the theory, uh, Dr. Rogers goes through that there are innovators and there are early adopters and there are, there are uh, mid-level mid adopters and there are late adopters and then there are lag, laggards and then there are non-adopters with any innovation. And so uh, it gives us a framework for understanding again why people accept innovations and why they don't. And it puts a lot of 
uh, emphasis on uh, opinion leaders. And that's ultimately what we are as Christians, is we're opinion leaders. We are, we are those who, um, who are able to socially diffuse the innovation of uh, the gospel. So, uh, considering evangelism as an innovation, and I presented to you, these are five innovations that the gospel brings to the scene that are relative advantages that the gospel brings over other worldviews. As I mentioned to you in the sermon yesterday, most people in the world, their worldview is do more good than bad, and you'll go to heaven, or you'll go to nirvana, or you'll be reincarnated as something better, or whatever it is that they believe. Uh, but uh, the gospel brings some qualities to the world that those do not bring. First of all, the gospel enables its inherent adherents to proclaim the glory of God. If you recall in last week's lesson, uh, we talked about how evangelism is hardwired into the very DNA of creation because God created creation to glorify Him, to give testimony to Him, to give testimony to His character, to His love. And that when we fell, when we... Uh, when, when our uh, oldest ancestors chose to step away from God to sin, uh, and, and sin came upon all of us, we made a choice not to glorify God. And those who are those who are spiritually dead are not glorifying God in their daily lives. But we who know Christ, we are able to proclaim the glory of God. We are able to glorify God with our uh, our lives. Uh, secondly, the gospel frees it, its adherents, adherents from the burden of works. You know, a checklist, a to-do list is a lot of burden. And I don't know if any of you have come out of backgrounds where there was a belief, and in some churches even we find this, the do's and don'ts, that you got to do these things to uh, be good uh, with God. You, you, you can't do these things to be good with God. It's a burden. It really is a burden because how do you know if you've done enough? How do you know if you're good enough? How do you, how do you know if you have, have made it? And, and being in Christ frees us of that. We don't have that burden of having to earn something. Number three, the gospel provides its her adherence with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It seals them, teaches them, gifts them, and bears fruit, fruit through them. You know, having God in you, how many of you would agree? That's a good innovation. Having God in you, with you, that is great. Nobody else has that. The world does not have the Holy Spirit. The world does not see the Holy Spirit. But we do, who are in Christ. And that is something that we have going for us. Uh, number four, there's the abundant life. How many of you think your life is better in Christ? I know mine is. Yeah, I know my life is better in Christ. Yeah, and, and this is something that you may encounter uh, if you talk to people. Uh, when people say, hey, uh... You know, I don't want to go to church, I don't have to give up all these things. But you're giving up this for this. You know, it's, 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 it's like the parable of the, of the pearl of great price, the man who found the pearl, sold all he had, bought the pearl. Uh, what we give up does not even compare to what we gain in Christ. And then, of course, there's eternal reward. There's heaven. And, and honestly, that's what most people are drawn to uh, that's, that's the drawing card. I know for me, when I came to Christ, uh, I knew I didn't want to go to hell. I knew I wanted to go to heaven. I mean, that's... Uh, and that tends to be a very selfish way of looking at things. You know, you know I, I can't say you know, I really want to glorify God, but the reality is the Holy Spirit was at work in Christ. And so these are some innovations uh, that come from the gospel. Now, the thing about these innovations, okay... Is there apparent to those of us who have been in Christ, who, who are in Christ, who, who spend time worshiping, spend time in the Word? They're apparent to us. We know that they are there. But does the world see them? They, they, they usually don't. They usually don't see those as being innovative. And so, though we know there is innovation in the Gospel, there's, there's some work to be done to spiritually prepare the soil. And sorry, Murphy, I'm glad you brought up that passage because it, it was a perfect segue into what we're, what we're doing here. Uh, is, is God is the one who spiritually prepares the soil. But we can be involved in that. Anybody ever grow up on a farm? 
Close enough. Close enough. Yeah, for bear on farming. It's all farming. <laughs> What? There's a bear on. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, <coughs> even when it's not planting season. There's always work to be done on a farm. I mean, equipment has to be mended. Uh, you know, when especially you know, I live. You know, I, I call South Dakota home. And in South Dakota, you know, they, they grow a lot of wheat, and every spring they have to go out in the fields. The ice, because the ground freezes, pushes the rocks up. You have to go out there and get those rocks out, and, and that's. That's a lot of work. And so before the planting happens, you've got to go get all the rocks out, and then you've got to till it. And then, uh, you know, thanks to the innovations of science, they go out there and they, they check the soil. And, and so like in Illinois, at Scott Air Force Base this year, they didn't get enough s snow, so the soil didn't have enough nitrogen in it. So they had to plant clover before they planted the corn so that the soil would have more nitrogen in it. A lot of work to farm. You don't just go out there, read this image of the kicked back farmer sitting back on his porch just watching the crops grow. There's a lot of work that comes to farming. And so that's what I want us to focus on tonight. And uh, I want us to focus on three particular spiritual disciplines a little bit. And these are disciplines that God's people have practiced over the centuries to help prepare themselves for the action of evangelism, but also to start preparing the spiritual soil. And so that's what I want to go over tonight. Uh, and so I skipped one. Hold on. All right, there we go. I had to check something. Okay, and so First spiritual, uh, first innovation I want us to focus on a little bit is prayer. Now, when we talk about prayer, and, and you're probably thinking, Chaplain, I pray. I pray every day. I pray for my food. I pray for... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling you you have to stop and... I mean, I'm, I'm sure you did, you know. Then there's always the, you know, bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me. You know, there's the, the after prayer, right? Uh, it's in the Psalms. It's a funny one. But nonetheless... Um, there is the discipline of, of prayer. And prayer is something that we can do to help prepare the spiritual soil. And being very strategic in the way that we pray. Uh, this is a quote from Richard Foster, a book that I've, I've actually bought this book about four or five times. I keep giving my copies away. Uh, so, so I will periodically go on Amazon and buy the used ones for like a penny. You know? Uh, you can you can do that. Anybody do that? I I, I love Amazon.com. I, mean, I go on there. I, I you, know, you do like used books. It's four dollars shipping. But it's four dollars shipping, but it's still five bucks. But then you check, see what that vendor's got, and they may have a lot of other stuff. And you know, for like ten bucks, you might get ten books. Uh, it's pretty great. But uh, Richard Foster, Celebration of Discipline. Uh, Richard Foster is, is a Quaker individual, by the way, which is a faith that we don't typically see in the military community. But Quakers tend to be very contemplative, and they tend to really have insight into a lot of the disciplines. And, and he says this about prayer. He says, prayer catapults us to the frontier of the spiritual life. Of all the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the most central because it ushers into us, ushers us into perpetual communion with the Father. A couple highlights there that really struck me. Uh, spiritual frontier. Isn't that, isn't that exciting? The, the frontier of the spiritual life. Uh, it sounds like uh, trailblazers, you know, going across the, the Great Plains in a Conestoga wagon, you know, striking out on your own, sod busting. It just, it really gives that image of, I'm on the cutting edge of something, and prayer is where that is. And then uh, perpetual communion. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Perpetual communion with the Father. In 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.17, uh, the Scriptures tell us to pray without ceasing. And I remember the first time I, I ever read that verse, I was a baby, baby Christian. In my mind, to pray, you had to close your eyes. And uh, I was like, so, you know, of course in my mind, I'm like, how am I going to drive? <laughs> How am I going to drive anywhere? I can't walk. How am I going to walk? You know, I was in high school. I can't find my classes. How does this work? Well, you know, of course, prayer posture doesn't have to be closing your eyes. But nonetheless, perpetual communion is out there for us. Now, I mentioned to you that um, as, a, as a prayer strategy, 
uh, you know, we need to, it's, it's more than praying for our daily needs. It's more than praying for Aunt Ruth's big toe and her gout. It's more than uh, even praying uh, just for safety. Uh, what we're talking about here is, is, is a prayer. And, and by the way, there are two types of prayer. There's the individual prayer, and then there's the corporate prayer. Next week is all about corporate prayer. Okay? So there's a teaser for next week. Next week's all about corporate prayer. Tonight we're focusing on spiritual prayer because our main focus is on getting us as the evangelist ready to share our faith. So th that's the focus. Next week when we talk corporate, we're going to talk more about the soil preparing. Though this will do that as well, our own soil. They'll prepare our own soil. But we'll talk about uh, preparing the, so the soil as the sower next week a little bit more. We talk about corporate prayer, but a prayer growth strategy... Uh, that is good for you. If only I could be as eloquent as Paul. And the book of Ephesians is a masterful document. A great book. In Ephesians 3, he prays this beautiful prayer for the Ephesian church, but it's a, it's a prayer we can take for ourselves. Let me read it for you. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Doesn't that just sort of bring tears to your eyes? Paul, is, Paul prayed this for us. Something we can pray for ourselves. Something we can pray uh, for other believers. Now, what I want us to do is break this down a little bit. Uh, and this breakdown, by the way, comes from Alexander McLaren. Alexander McLaren was a 19th century Scottish pastor, but he pastored in England. Um, who, uh, he, he was Baptist. In fact, he was president of the Baptist World Alliance at one point. And uh, he is kind of my go-to guy uh, when, when for commentaries. He, he never actually wrote a commentary. Uh, what happened was, uh, when he uh, got up there at age and before he died... Uh, his family compiled all his sermons. And they made commentaries. He'd actually preached on every verse in the Bible. And they compiled it all. So, uh, McLaren is my go-to guy. And um, uh, he points out in here that, first of all, verses 14 through 16 are a prayer for strength. Who needs strength? We need strength. We need strength uh, to be able to live victoriously. We need strength to say no to temptation. We need strength to... Uh, to remind ourselves that we're redeemed by grace, not by works. We need strength to uh, rely upon um, other believers. And then verse 17 is a prayer for indwelling. Now, scripturally the Bible tells us, as Jesus pointed out there in, in John chapter 14, that the Spirit is with us and in us. And, and that uh, the Spirit, it says in Ephesians 1, that the Holy Spirit seals us. So it's my conviction, uh, and and I know that there are some Christian denominations who might disagree with me on this, and I respectfully uh, disagree with them as brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters can disagree, right? Okay, soapbox for a moment. We're entering this world where people, they disagree and they defriend each other on Facebook. <laughs> you know, some of, my best, some of the people I really love, I disagree with, you know. Mature people can disagree. Uh, but it's my belief that, that the Holy Spirit dwells inside every believer. It's not a second blessing. It's not, uh, and He's not a second blessing. And uh, that the Holy Spirit is with you. But uh, nonetheless, uh, just because the Holy Spirit is in you doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is filling you and, and, and overflowing out of you. And so a prayer for that indwelling of the Spirit to, to take over your life. And then verses 18 through 19 are prayer to understand God's love. I don't know about you, I don't understand God's love fully. I'll tell you this, I know God's love more than I used to. Anybody ever drive across Kansas to Colorado? A few of you have. You have. 
Yeah, okay. If you drive across Kansas to Colorado, you hit the Colorado line. When you think Colorado, what do you think? Hills, mountains. Hills, mountains. Not, not at the Colorado line. It's still, it's like, well, this is still corn and sunflowers. This is, this is flat as can be. But you, you keep driving, and you get to a point where you can see the mountains. And I recall uh, riding with my, my youngest, uh, driving across uh, to, to Buckley from me. Scott, and, I mean from uh, Robin, she was five years old. We were playing this game, they said, let's cover the mountains. We see it, like, I can cover the mountains. You can hold up your thumb, and you, can, you can cover the mountains. Now, why can you do that? You're still a long ways away. But then, you get next, to, then you get closer and closer, by the time you get to Denver, you, you can do this, and you can't even cover the mountains. But if you've been to Denver, you know you're, you're not even in the mountains yet. You've still got another 20 miles to get to the mountains. Then you go over a hill, and then you go to what you think is the top of the mountains, and then there's more mountains. So that's kind of how the love of God is. The closer you are to the love of God, the bigger the love of God is, and the less you understand it. I'm convinced of that. I am firmly convinced of that. I thought I truly understood what... God's love was about. I thought I understood what holiness was about when I was a baby Christian. I thought I had it all, but the closer I grow to God, the more I realize how deep and how big it truly is. Paul wanted us to get to that point. He wants us to understand how ginormous the love of God is. And then finally, it was a prayer for God to be glorified. And ultimately, that's why we exist. We exist to glorify God. And uh, we do that uh, through our daily lives. We do that through evangelism. Now, a second uh, discipline, uh, again, prayer, we do that, uh, prayer is part of that. And a quote, I, I want to throw out a quote real quick, uh, this is from McLaren, uh, he's talking about uh, the prayer for the indwelling, and I thought I had a slide on it, I didn't, so I'm going to read it. Uh, the apostle here uses a compound word which conveys the idea of intensity and continuity. What he desires then is not merely that these Ephesian Christians may have occasional visits of the indwelling Lord, or that some lofty moments of spiritual enthusiasm that they may be conscious that he is with them, but that always in an unbroken line of deep, calm receptiveness, they may possess and know that they possess an indwelling Savior. Doesn't that sound great? Intensity and continuity. Paul wanted us first to know that, that, it, that every given moment we would know God was with us. And I want you to think to your own life, and you don't have to answer out loud, but if you knew at every moment God was with you, it would, it would influence your behavior, wouldn't it? It would influence your actions. And, and, you know, I think what else? It would influence your moods. You would know, okay, God is with me. And it would, it would help you. It would help you in those situations where you're anxious. It would help you in those situations where you're struggling. Just to know that God is with you. So, the, so that's a prayer strategy right there for personal growth. And, and, and so when we're talking about the spiritual discipline of prayer right here, that's what we're talking about. Second spiritual discipline is fasting. Now, again, I go to Richard Foster for a definition. It's abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Now, if you go on the interweb, there's all kinds of articles on fasting. People fasting from sugar. But, uh, I've, got, I've got a friend of mine, there's, there's a, a diet she's doing, something 30... Uh, it, it, it makes paleo seem progressive. I mean, if you're on the paleo, I, I don't, I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, don't see, I didn't see the cavemen finding out ways to cook brownies without grain. I, yeah. so it, hers looks like real paleo. It's like nuts and twigs. I mean, it really is. And, uh, but you know, the goal is to fast from sugar, fast from gluten, fast from grain. You, know, you see a lot about that. And, and so, but that's a fast for physical purposes, okay? And then even then, a lot of times, and, and we have to be careful a lot of times when we look at what other people are teaching. The scriptures tell you you're to test everything and hold on to the good. And I hope that everything I ever tell you, you test. I hope you, you consider it. I hope you look at the scriptures and that you weigh it because I'm just a man. And uh, the scriptures should inform you what the truth is. Uh, but there's a lot out there about fasting for spiritual purposes, uh, more on the, you know, for, for spiritual wealth, you know, for physical wealth. So, you know, my bank account can, can 
increase. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're also not talking about hunger fasts. Uh, those are, those are polit that's for political reasons. The purpose uh, that we're talking about fasting is for you to grow closer to God, to be more in tune to the Holy Spirit. That is the fasting we're talking about here. And, and so, um, it's a very different type of fasting. Now, I will also say that there are different fasts that we find in the Bible. We find uh, Jesus, when he was in the desert 40 days and 40 nights, what kind of fast was that? That was a total fast. It wasn't even water. I, I would... I don't know a doctor on the planet who would recommend that. Um, if you think the Holy Spirit's leading you to that, you better know the Holy Spirit is leading you to do that. And then we find people fasting from, from uh, you know, just food. We find uh, the Daniel fast, uh, which is, in, is mentioned. In, and we'll, we'll actually talk about that. We're going to talk about Daniel in, chapter, in session six, by the way. It's going to be all about Daniel and, and workplace evangelism. Uh, we find that he and his, uh, and, and, and the three individuals known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they, they didn't want to eat the king's food, and so they, they asked the, the king's, their, their, their boss, if they could live on vegetables and water. So it was not a fast from food, but it's a fast from certain foods. And, and you can even mix that in. It could be a fast from coffee. It could be a fast from chocolate. It could be a fast, uh, it could even be like a media fast. Uh, the goal here is to abstain from something for spiritual reasons, for the purpose of prayer, for the purpose of spending time with God. So uh, there's a lot of different fasts, and time, time doesn't go into that, and we can talk more on fast, fasting offline. Richard Foster has a great chapter in, on it in his book. But I want us to look a little bit at what the spiritual purposes are for fasting. And, and this is from another book, Donald Whitney, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. Also a good book. I, I, I like Foster, but Whitney's got a good book out there too. This is not a government endorsement. Okay. So uh, fasting and prayer help us to focus our heart on God. How often each day do most of us think about food? I'm a foodie. It's a lot. It's a lot. I, I eat five, five to six small meals a day usually. I, I, to, for me, the big meals are more the exception and not the rule. So that's that's a lot of time I'm spending thinking about food. You know, about what's the next meal. I haven't had dinner. Honestly, I'll tell you straight up. Kind of thinking about that a little bit. Uh, but uh, when we fast, the time that we would spend, if if you're doing a food fast, the time that you would spend thinking about food, preparing food, eating food, cleaning up after food, would be spent in prayer. And it allows you to focus your heart on God who, who can release that supernatural power in your life. And it causes you to reflect upon something very differently. If you recall when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert, he would fast in 40 days, 40 nights. I'm sure anything looked good. Uh, you know, he was, the Bible says he was all God, but he was also all it's all man, right? You know what that tells me? He was hungry. He was probably pretty hungry. And, and Satan, Satan tempted him to do what? Turn stone into bread. Turn stone into bread, right? Could he have done it? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, you know, God told Moses, to, you know, he, he had manna come from heaven. But Jesus replied to him, he, he didn't say no, he didn't say you're a jerk, or he didn't do anything like that. What did he say to him? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How often do we really put that to the test, though? Fasting gives us an opportunity to put that to the test. And as we put that to the test, we get direction. Jesus' purpose in that fast, if you recall, it was in, it, it's mentioned in uh, Matthew chapter 4. After that, he went with his public ministry. This was him getting ready. Uh, it could have been that he was considering who the twelve would be. It could have been him considering what his journey would be. I'll go here and then I'll... It, it could have been a, a, a masterful strategy session to him and his father. Uh, and he fasted. So it's an opportunity to get wisdom and direction. Um, another purpose of fasting is Jesus encourages fasting and prayer. There was a situation right after... Uh, remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus, and Peter, and James, and John, they go up to the mountain... And they see Moses and Elijah, and it's a great experience. And 
Peter wants to build three shelters so they can build black up there. And Jesus, and God speaks from heaven and says, basically tells them to be quiet, listen to Jesus. They go off the mountain, they come back, the others are down there. There's, a, there's, there's someone who brought a, a, a demon-possessed child to the disciples, and they were unable to cast out the demon. And Jesus makes a statement, he says, this type can only come out by prayer and fasting. And, and the reality is, and, 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 and on that note, by the way, I don't believe Christians can be demon-possessed. The Holy Spirit's possessing us. There's no room. There's just there's no room in the house. Uh, but nonetheless, you may have some struggles that you really can't kick. Maybe it's an addiction. Uh, maybe it's, it's a habit. Maybe it, it's, it's something that's like, you know, you, you would say, you know, chaplain, I've been, you know, I've been trying to give up pornography. Or I'm an alcoholic, or, or something like that. And you just can't do it. My advice to you is throw in some fasting. And, you know, you just go to battle with that thing, and, and, and you get your deliverance. And so uh, Jesus encourages it for that purpose. But then uh, also, uh, fasting and prayer breaks the darkness that overwhelms and hinders the nations and defeats the territorial spirit that hinders word evangelism. Okay. Now, before I go to Daniel, some of you maybe never caught this passage. Okay, this might send chills up your spine when you read this and you consider it. Okay, because we're talking spiritual warfare. So I'm giving you the disclaimer: spiritual warfare passage next. Okay, in Daniel chapter ten, verses twelve through fourteen, when we pick up in the middle of the chapter. Uh, all right, there's, there's an angel that was going to come to Daniel. And in this passage leading up to it, Daniel has been fasting and praying for this angel to give him a word from the Lord. And then verse 12, uh, the angel speaking to Daniel, he says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. Okay. At this point, he's been fasting 21 days. Okay. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. We're talking about who? Who is this that's talking right now? An angel, right? You want to get that image of angels being cute and cuddly and like the little cherubs on the stamp? But what happens every time an angel nearly, you know, what happens every time an angel appears in the Bible to include at this situation? What do they say? Fear not. Why do you think they say fear not? Because they're scary looking. I think they're scary looking. They are absolutely scary looking. Angels are tough dudes. Okay? These are tough, they're good guys, but they're tough dudes. And so every time an angel appears, the people are afraid. Okay? So we're talking an angel here. But he was withstood by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I read several commentaries on this, and they're all pretty much in agreement. And, and not just Christian commentaries, I read some Jewish commentaries on this too. I was like, what what are the people who don't claim Christ as Lord? What do they even say about this passage? There's actually agreement on this one. Prince of the kingdom of Persia would have been a demon. So apparently this really strong demon withstood an angel of the Lord for 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, okay? Michael's an archangel. So apparently, you know, there are ranks within the angels. There are strength levels within the angels. Came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. And came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. So what I find, and it just gives me chills on this one. There are forces of evil out there so powerful that even angels struggle with them. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this. And, and, and this, this may really rock your world what I'm about to say. But I know that I have, pers I have personally gone from one place to another and felt darkness. Uh, there, there, you know, I, I know I've entered, I've, there's certain, even in the U.S., um, my wife is from Utah. I love the state of Utah. You enter the state of Utah and there is a presence there. I'm convinced of it. You may think I'm crazy that chaplains lost it, but 
Scripture seems to indicate that there are geographic forces of darkness so strong that even angels struggle with them. So what about us as human beings? If angels struggle, we might struggle too. And the fact is, if you're in Christ, God has you. You're secure. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. But these booger bears can make your life miserable. Okay? And fasting is the way to overcome them. Because preceding this, Daniel had fasted. Okay? So, again, first may give you chills. But it's God's word. And so, fasting is an important tool. And again, a fast doesn't necessarily equal a full fast. Um, but also as a reminder, and, and, and my medical professional back here would appreciate it if I said this. Talk to you. Consult your medical professional if there's anything. I mean, if you're on medication, if you're diabetic, or something like that. Okay. And then a, a fifth purpose of fasting, a spiritual purpose for fasting, is God will take our problems as we fast and pray in humility. Our battle becomes God's battle. There's something humbling about fasting. Because you realize just how dependent you are on something physical. How, how big a role food plays in your life. And it can be very, very humbling. In 2 Chronicles 20.15, uh, we find that um, the, the, the tribe of Judah is under oppression by an invading nation. And King Jehoshaphat... Uh, declares a fast. And he goes before the Lord, prays a beautiful prayer there, uh, and concludes, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And he claims a fast, and then uh, the prophet comes, and he says, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. We see a beautiful picture with this, and, and, and the rest of the story is, they win. They win the battle. But leading up to it, we see that God's people just humble themselves and they pray and they fast and they just go before God. They get to the point where it's, their prayers aren't, God, it would be great if you would help us. It's like, God, we can't do anything. We're done. If you don't do anything here, we're done. And they got to that point through fasting and through prayer. Now, um, I want to give you an effect, uh, you know, and, and one of my goals here. You know, we see the example, you know, prayer examples. We we had Paul there. Uh, we saw the, the prayer that Paul prayed for us. But you know, from historical perspective, an example of fasting on evangelism is right here in this country. Did you know that the Korean Church is one of the fastest growing church movements in the world? And a lot of people don't realize the city of Gunsan is the most Christianized nation in the world. Uh, city in the world right now. We are in what is becoming the Bible Belt, the new Bible Belt. As the United States is turning its back on the Lord, the Korean people are accepting Christ right and left. Now this has not always been the case. If you know a little bit about Korean history, you know that the nation divided after the Korean War was decimated. Anybody know what the religion was at that point, primarily? It's primarily Buddhism. But uh, there were Thousands and thousands of Christians who committed themselves to fasting and praying. And if you ever have the privilege to get to know uh, a Korean pastor, uh, Moksani, by the way, is the word uh, for, for a Korean pastor, or a really committed layperson, they will tell the stories. Fasting and prayer is part of the regular battle rhythm of the South Korean church and even of the Korean people. Uh, Korean Christians in the United States as well. Um, I, I had the honor of being associate pastor of a Korean church uh, when I was in seminary. And that was part of our battle rhythm. Uh, Moksani would, would get up and say, okay people, we're going to this retreat and we're going to fast and we're going to pray. And we're going to get up at 5 in the morning and we're going to pray all day long. And we're going to fast. And we're going to wait for God to do something in us. Uh, and so, uh, and this is a I'm going to read sort of a testimony uh, here of the effect of, uh, it's, it's actually quoted in John Piper's book, A Hunger for God, about the, the Korean church. It says, 
In the latter years of the 20th century, fasting and prayer have almost become synonymous with the churches of South Korea. And there is good reason. The first Protestant church was planted in Korea in 1884. 100 years later, there were 30,000 churches. That's an average of 300 new churches a year for 100 years. That's a lot of churches when you consider the population of this nation. 300 churches a year for 100 years. At the end of the 20th century, evangelicals comprise about 30% of the population. God has used many means to do this great work. One of them is recovery not just of dynamic prayer, but of fasting and prayer. For example, in the overseas mission, missionary society churches alone, more than 20,000 people have completed a 40-day fast. Remember I told you, Lord better tell you to do a 40-day fast. They've had over 20,000 people in that one denomination complete a 40-day fast, usually at one of their prayer houses in the mountains. And so if you want to look at an example of what fasting does in the life of the Christian, look no further than outside the gates. Uh, this is... It's, it's a miracle what God is doing here in South Korea. Uh, South Korea uh, is now, is quickly becoming one of the biggest uh, missionary sending nations in the world, by the way. So, uh, Korean church practices fasting pretty much as a pra uh, practice. So, fasting is a spiritual discipline. Then there's a third spiritual discipline I'd like for us to focus on, and that is Bible study. Now, as a definition of Bible study, again, I go to Richard Foster. It's a specific kind of experience in which thorough, that should say thorough, not through. Spell check doesn't check it when you put the wrong word, you know. Thorough, careful attention to, to reality. The mind is enabled to move in a certain direction. Now, when I mention Bible study, I mean that as opposed to just devotional Bible reading. And, and, and that's good, too. There's different reasons to read the Bible. One of them is devotional Bible reading. I know I practice that, too. You get up, I get up in the morning. There's certain things I do every day. Every day I read, uh, before I even get out of bed, I read a, a chapter from the Gospels. I read a chapter from the Old Testament. I read a chapter from the New Testament, not the Gospels. And then I read the proverb of the day. Okay, so for example, today is the 16th. So today I read the 16th proverb. So... My favorite one is the 12th, and if you ever read it, you'll laugh and you'll, you'll understand me. Uh, but, but what we're talking about is thorough, careful attention to what Scripture has to say. Now, I know many of you are involved in Bible studies here, but on a personal level, you can also uh, do Bible study. And, and, and the great thing about the Internet is it used to be that, that books, you had to buy books, you know. And if you go to you go to a lot of pastors' offices, their studies are just full of books. And I had somebody ask me the other day why didn't why my office wasn't full of books. Well, a lot of it's online or on computer now. You can actually get a lot of that. And even so much, if you want to know what the Greek or the Hebrew says to something, you, there are free tools out there that that will get you there. And uh, they'll probably get you ninety percent there. You know. I read both, so if you ever do that, hey, what is it? Well, let's talk. I love those conversations, by the way. But the reality is, there are so many tools to just dig into the Bible on your own. Now, I do preface personal Bible study to say, before you think you've come up with some spiritual truth that nobody's ever seen, go talk to somebody. Okay? It's probably been seen, and it might be heresy. We want to protect from that. Uh, but nonetheless, Bible study is important. But to the task of being an evangelist, of practicing evangelism, of witnessing, it is particularly important. And so what I want us to do now is look at what Scripture says about Scripture. Uh, these are five verses, Romans 10, 17. But faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. Now, I've been guilty of this in the past, trying to rationalize God with people. Just trying to use the rational mind. The fact is, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. When I was in seminary, I was challenged. Uh, Dr. James White, he is a Christian apologist. And I had him for a, a, a philosophy of Christianity class. And uh, he really changed my perspective on that. Because uh, he, he, he is a big proponent of what's called presuppositional apologetics. And that is, people only hear what their, percept, what their presuppositions will allow them to hear. So you deal with the presupposition, and then you get to the Word as soon as possible. That's, that's what that means. 
And that's why, because you can rationalize with people all day long, but the Word of Christ is where faith comes from. 1 Timothy 2.15 uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Did anybody ever do a wana? Like have their kids in a wana? Uh, my kids are in a wana. My youngest is still in a wana. Uh, it's a great program. Approved workmen are not ashamed. That's what a wana stands for. This is the key verse from it. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Part of being approved as a worker is knowing the word. Then, 1 Timothy 3.16, I love this. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Some translations say God breathed. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Your Bible is your spiritual toolkit, right here. Everything's in there to tell you what to do. And then 1 Peter uh, 1, so, so you can see that it's not just Paul that believes it, it's others. One thing I find interesting about this is all Scripture. When Paul wrote those words, he was talking about the Old Testament. You can lead somebody to Christ from the Old Testament. But 1 Peter 1, 22-23, Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding what? Word of God. The Word of God is power. And, and there are so many stories, and I love to hear these stories, of, of, uh, of a guy in Uganda who was at a flea market, and there was a Bible in a language he didn't even know, but he was drawn to the Bible. And so he buys it and then walks 200 miles to someone he knows it, understands that language, and says, please tell me what this book says. I don't know why I need to know and then the person reads it, and then they, they come to Christ. I mean, I don't know if you've heard those stories, but missionaries tell those kind of stories where, you know, we, we probably have an abundance of Bibles, but yet here's a guy who can't even read it but just knows that book right there. I need to know what's in that book. Uh, there was a tribe um, there, there was a tribe in uh, somewhere in Southeast Asia, I can't remember where, I think it was in Burma, who uh, in the, the 19th century, um, this tribe was known as being brutal to outsiders. But yet some missionaries had prayed and they felt compelled to go. And um, being the time, they didn't really dress indigenous. I mean, they, dressed, they were Europeans. They dressed like Europeans. But they all went to this village and, and they all had black Bibles. Because that's what mo the color most Bibles were. And the people welcomed with open arms and said, what do you have to say to us? And they told them, they preached, and everybody came to Christ. Well, they were sitting back and talking about it, you know, several months later through the discipleship. And uh, the, the, uh, the chief of this tribe uh, told the missionaries, they said, the reason we listened to you, the reason we didn't treat you harshly, is because the demons told us that someone would come to our village carrying a black book and bring us the words of life. And the demons told us not to listen to you. Well, we didn't want to do what the demons said. The Word of God is powerful, and we need to be in it. We need to be spending time in it. And that is a spiritual discipline, that if you're going to share Christ with people, start with the Word. Because the Word is power. So those are three spiritual disciplines. And these, again, are spiritual disciplines that you can use to prepare yourselves for the task of sharing your faith. Okay? And so, for your homework, your homework is simple this week. Okay? I want you to consider the three disciplines. Anyway, I went over prayer, and uh, it's prayer, and, and, I, and I gave you the example from Ephesians 3, the Ephesians 3 prayer. Uh, I gave you fasting, and it could be complete or moderate or partial. And I gave you Bible study. What I would like to encourage you to do, and I don't have a handout because I'm telling you what your homework is, pick one of these three and apply yourself to it this week. Okay? And just make a change. Work one of these into your routine. Uh, maybe, maybe, your prayer, maybe you don't pray or maybe your prayers have been largely you know, for things or for needs or even for others. And those aren't bad prayers. Please pray those still. You know, we're told scripturally, you know, Jesus told us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And, you know, we're told to pray for ourselves. But 
But pray for your own growth. Read through that Ephesians 3 passage again. And, and, and pray for your, yourselves for spiritual growth. Or, or choose to fast. Um, if you drink a lot of coffee, okay, don't drink coffee and not eat. I'm just going to give that to you. That's bad. Okay. It, 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 it's bad if you're addicted to coffee. But consider, you could consider a partial fast. You can consider a full fast. You can consider, you know, fasting for meat or soda or desserts or, or something. Okay. You and the Holy Spirit talk about that. Or consider studying the Bible and really digging into things, more so than just devotional reading. So that's my challenge to this week, is to implement uh, one or more of these spiritual disciplines to get yourself ready. Now, the next four weeks, uh, next week we'll is preparing the spiritual soil. I've already kind of given you an overview. We're going to talk about corporate prayer. We talked a little bit about individual prayer. We're talking about corporate prayer. Uh, this week, session four, we'll get into some evangelism style. Session five, we'll talk a little bit about lifestyle. Session six, the workplace, our mission field, uh, will actually be, as I mentioned to you, we're going to talk about Daniel as the example of someone in your position, in our position, as, as those under authority in a constrained environment, sharing their faith. So, with that, any closing thoughts, questions? If you did not sign in, please sign in. And I'll close this in prayer. God, thank you that you desire that we know you. You desire that we trust you. We desire that uh, you desire that we be moved by you and that we do your will. So God, we ask that you would work in us, through us, with us, to help us to take measures to, to know you more be it through prayer, be it through study, be it through fasting, be it through all three. God, I pray that you will help us to pursue you, to gain victory over strongholds in our lives, to gain understanding of your love for us, and to learn how to have you as our constant, intense partner in ministry and in life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much.